Hi everyone, I'm Eddie. I'm Ashwin. And I'm Raj. And this is Blood Cancer Talks, a podcast dedicated to hematologic malignancies where we bring content experts who live and breathe a particular disease and focus on the latest advances in biology and clinical management. Please take a moment to rate and review us in whichever app you listen to your podcasts in. Today, we are very excited to review the hottest updates in lymphoma from ASCO and EHA just gone, held in Chicago and Madrid, respectively. And we're very delighted to be joined by Dr. Gloria Iacoboni, a hematologist from the University Hospital Val Hebron in Barcelona and an expert in lymphoma and in immunotherapy. Uh, before we get stuck into the exciting abstracts, could you give us a little bit of background about yourself uh, and your research and clinical interests, Gloria? Sure. Uh, first, thanks for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm a big fan of the podcast, so <laughs> I'm happy to be in it. So actually, I was born in the United States. I was born in Seattle, Washington. And then my dad is from LA, and then they decided to move to Spain. And I grew up in Valencia, which is a kind of a smaller city south of Barcelona. And I did my training there as a hematologist. And when I ended my training, I decided to go abroad for a year. So I went to Lugano in Switzerland. And did further lymphoma training with the Lugano team, who hosts the ICML meeting uh, every two years. And then I decided I want to come back to Spain. And that's how I landed in 2017 in Barcelona at Balibron Hospital. And started uh, working there with clinical trials in lymphoma. Had I then become passionate of lymphoma after <laughs> being in Lugano for one year? You know, the bispecific antibodies were just starting out with the trials. We had some trials with adronextamab and glufitamab initially, and then also started with mozimetizumab and acritamab. So I handled those trials. That was great to get some hands-on experience managing CRS and other adverse events associated to these types of agents. And then we started with the Transcend World trial in 2018. So that was quite exciting. That was my first contact with CAR T-cell therapy in 2018, managing patients with lysocell inside the trans and world trial. We recruited quite a lot of patients on that trial and then started with commercial CAR T-cell therapy in early 2019, first with Tisacell and then in September of 2019 with Axacell. So at, at our center, we treated over 300 patients with CAR T-cell therapy, approximately two thirds commercial, one third on clinical trials, and a maybe passionate in immunotherapy, lymphoma management, happy to be able to participate in this podcast today. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us for our ASCO EHA highlights episode, Gloria. Very appropriately, I think we'll start with a bi-specific themed abstract under the DLB DLBCL theme, which is of course StarGlow. So I'll give a little bit of background and then throw to you for your thoughts and reflections. So Starglow is a randomized controlled trial for patients with diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. About 274 patients were randomized uh, two to one to either receive rituximab plus gemcitabine oxaliplatin, r gemox, or glufitimab, which as you mentioned, CD20, CD3, bispecific antibody plus gemox. And it's for second or later line, the transplant ineligible in the second line or, or for those with greater than one prior line. And I think first it's worth before we jump in too far is, is to look a bit at the patients who were enrolled the, 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 across both arms. Because I think one of the challenges that you're going to help us with is where to put this data into the, the world of DOBCL, which compared to myeloma land, we often tease Raj is very nice and clear where all the data fits. And it's, it's going to be a little harder, I think, to put this one into exactly where it fits. So patients with transform follicular lymphoma, high-grade B-cell lymphoma, double-hit lymphoma are excluded. About two thirds of patients were getting Glofit or Argemox in the second line, whereas one third were getting it in the third or later line. About 40, 50% were ECOG 0, ECOG 1, so 90% ECOG 0 to 1, and about 50 to 60% primary refractory, and only 7 to 9% prior CAR T. And the median age was 68. What do you make of this population? Where are we going to, when we get to the data, where are we going to fit it into our overall DOBCL schema? I think that's the first point. I'm not sure it really has a clear space. I have a feeling that the centers, we did not participate in this trial, but I have a feeling the centers who participated were centers who probably did not yet have CAR T cell therapy in the second line and therefore recruited a lot of second line patients into this trial. So now that we do have CAR T cell therapy in, in the second line, I think that the results are more mature and we, we can't really think that the Glofid DMOX results seem even remotely better, of course, than, than CAR T cells. So 
I mean, we don't have the randomized trial, but still they're not much, much higher in terms of CR rate than what we are have seen in the Zuma 7 study. So I don't think it has a clear space right now. I think, as you mentioned, there are several things with this trial. So most of the patients, at least two thirds, were enrolled in the second line setting. And some of them did not seem to be really transplant ineligible. That's another issue. We work with some trials and sometimes the whole transplant ineligible for younger patients or comorbidities can be tricky. Sometimes you can mention that patients, you can say that patients aren't transplant ineligible because they're ref- chemo refractory. But then in fact, you, if you get them into a CR, they could potentially be transplant eligible in terms of, let's say, AIDS and comorbidities. So sometimes that chemo refractory criteria to justify that they are transplant ineligible can get you into these trials. And, and in fact, during the presentation, Jeremy Abramson mentioned that a few patients did eventually get to a transplant, autologous or allogeneic stem cell transplant. So they, in terms of fitness and, and AIDS and comorbidities, they were probably some of them transplant eligible, but were considered not probably because of the chemo refractory nature of their disease. So one thing would be this issue that would be interesting to, to look in, in further. The other thing is our DMOX was given every three weeks instead of every two weeks. And it is true that sometimes we're obliged to do this because of remaining toxicity. We need to delay the commercial our DMOX, but it is true that the standard, let's say, way of doing it is every two weeks. This would be also out of the standard. I think another issue would be very small number of patients had received prior CAR T cell therapy below 10%. How would this treatment perform in the post CAR T space would be another issue. So post CAR T space, third line or later, all of this would probably reduce the complete response rate, shorten the, the, the PFS results. Follow-up is short. We need longer follow-up to better understand the curative potential of this treatment, what fraction of patients can be potentially cured on each arm. The RDMOX results are below what we can expect with our DMOX. So in the trials and in real-world data, it ranges from 30 to 50. No, 50 is a little high, but let's say 30 to 40%. Here it was approximately 25%, the CR rate. So the control arm was also fared a bit worse than what we've seen in other studies of our DMOX. So I think there's all these issues, as you mentioned as well, high-grade B-cell lymphoma patients were excluded. Transformed follicular, which I'm surprised because these patients usually do even better with at least with CAR T-cell therapy and, and with other regimen. So I'm intrigued about why they excluded these patients. So it's just a lot of issues with this trial. Our DMOX seems like the easy control arm where you expect to get better results with whatever you throw on the other side. I, I do admire the, the primary overall survival endpoint. That's something in, in their favor, definitely. And I do think it's an interesting trial. I just think there are many kind of floating issues that make maybe some of the colleagues be a little bit wary of where does this schema go and how much do we trust that overall survival advantage. Yeah, let's, why don't we talk about the results and then we can absolutely... Oh, it's up the head on that. Yeah. <laughs> You were so excited to get into the results, but it's great. So, I was, sorry. <laughs> a little bit more on trial design. Yeah, it was eight cycles of our DMOX and eight cycles of Glofit DMOX, well, and then well, added cycles of Glofitamab well, monotherapy yeah. to mimic the pivotal phase one to trial of Glofitamab. Yes, and it was a two to one randomization, as you mentioned, primary endpoint overall survival. And to give the headline results for your comment, the overall response rate 68 versus 40%. Median overall survival, 13 months versus 25 and a half months with a significant uh, hazard ratio of 0.62 and a PFS, a median PFS that matches also significant as a secondary endpoint, 3.6 months versus 13.8 months. Certainly no doubt that the curves separate. And you famous famously had a slide in your debate at Lugano with a snowboarder on the Kaplan-Meier curve. So I'm very interested to hear what you think about the tail of these Kaplan-Meier curves. Yes, I think the interesting thing would have had would have been to have an arm with just glufitamab and understand what's the added benefit of the DMOX with the glufitamab because we know that glufitamab in the pivotal phase one two trial led to approximately 40% uh, complete response rate in the large B-cell lymphoma setting. And this is mainly a second line trial with over two thirds of patients in the second line. So maybe, you know, that 40% CR rate could have gone up to a 50% CR rate or even higher. So how much of the CR rate that we are seeing that 59% approx with glufitamab DMOX, how much is due to the glufitamab and how much is due to the DMOX? What's the added benefit? 
So I think that would have been interesting to have that, that added arm. And, and yeah, the, the fact is that the results with, with our DMOX are a tad below what is expected. So definitely the curves are separating that no doubt that's there, but we know that is also very dependent on how the control arm performs and what the control arm contains. I think the results are, of course, interesting, but I think there is still a big question mark of how much the DMOX is really adding to that glofitumab in the second line setting. Yeah, I think it's a great question, especially when we come to the kind of long-term disease control question. The same question comes up. We know glofit's an active, very active drug and... How much is the chemo adding is a great question. Let's chat briefly about tolerability. So in terms of grade three adverse events, 78%, grade three or greater adverse events, 78% in the glow fit arm versus 41. Grade five adverse events, eight versus 4.5%. And a higher rate of COVID-related AEs and COVID-related deaths in the glow fit Gemox arm. And of course, after midway through the protocol, they changed the protocol to discontinue any patients who got glowfit came who got covid sorry came off protocol so yeah what do you make of obviously the overall survival endpoint is reassuring because it means whatever fatal toxicity is even when that's factored in there's still an overall survival advantage but what do you make of the toxicity here do you think it's worth adding glowfit in the second line setting Yes, I think that's a great question. We actually had a lot of issues um, during the COVID pandemic with patients who were on bispecific antibody therapy with like persistent COVID infection for like months and months, uh, despite treatment for their COVID disease. Um, And we did have to stop bispecific antibody therapy for many patients who are in different clinical trials receiving this type of treatment. Um, So I do think this is a good measure. However, I I do think there's added toxicity from having both glofitumab and Zmox. I was, for example, surprised that there was like a higher rate of grade three or higher neuropathy with glofitumab Zmox than with just our Zmox, which to me is a bit surprising considering glofitumab by itself that does not usually give this adverse event. So I I think there is a higher, as expected, higher um, risk of infection and grade three, um, as you mentioned, or higher adverse events with glofitumab Zmox. I'm not sure this is, let's say, the, the, the part of the trial that I would, I would consider more unfavorable. I think it's to some extent expected. They have the Zmox related adverse events and the glufitamab related adverse events. And as you say, that did not impact overall survival. So I would be more cautious, let's say, in the efficacy part of interpreting that data than, than in the safety part. I think there's definitely, as can be expected, better safety profile for our Zmox without the CRS risk and all the added uh, adverse events associated to glufitamab. But this is, would not deter me from prescribing this regimen if I thought it was the best regimen for the patient in terms of efficacy. And just quickly going back to what you asked me before, medium follow-up was short. So I think we cannot answer the question yet about the flattening of the curves. I think we know there's a small curative potential fraction for our DMOX by itself, even if small. So I can expect that glufitamab DMOX would also provide some curative potential for some patients. How many will have to see with longer follow-up? Yeah, great. So I think the two questions to come back to is, how do you think this regimen compares to second-line CAR-T? And how do you think for places that don't have access to second-line CAR-T, how do you think this influences the paradigm? Yeah, so that's a great question. I I think... We go back to the Lugano debate, and I think with CAR T cell therapy in the second line, that's based on the Zuma 7 trial, and when in the third line, based on the Zuma 1, we're talking mainly about Axis cell, but we could talk about Lysis cell as well. Data is mature enough to confirm that curative potential and to provide, let's say, the, the fraction of patients that can benefit from that curative potential. So I, I think this is what kind of leans in favor of CAR T cell therapy. I think this is the one of the best, let's say, features of CAR T cell therapy. Of course, together with the efficacy, the overall survival benefit shown in the Zuma Seven study, and all the, of the real world data we have. So I think it's the mature data in the pivotal trials, the abundance of real world data reproducing similar efficacy and safety to the pivotal trials. And the many trials we have with CAR T cell therapy, not only in the third line, but in the second line and now data in, in first line is Zuma 12, for example. So I think all of this kind of leans in, in favor of CAR T cell therapy. It's true that we only look 
for example, if we look at CR rate, CMOX close to 59%, that's pretty good. So it could be even similar to what we can expect with, with CAR T cells. And I think it could be just as bispecifics could be in monotherapy, clofetumab TMOX can be a good alternative if CAR T cells are not available. If both treatment options are available, I would lean in the benefit of CAR T cell therapy. But if, of course, if that treatment option is not available and the patient is not a late relapser, because then I would probably consider in chemotherapy and ontologous stem cell transplant in the second line setting, if the patient is chemo refractory or relapsed early and we cannot access uh, CAR T, we know that the patient will unlikely benefit from chemo and transplant, clofitamab, DMOX, or even bispecific antibody therapy and monotherapy could be a good option. So I think it's definitely a good option, as you mentioned, for this setting where patients do not have access to CAR T cell therapy and have been refractory or have relapsed early after first-line immunochemotherapy. Yeah, I think on, the, on exactly that theme, the two other abstracts in, in the DLBCL space I wanted to briefly get your thoughts on. The first data from the EPCO Polar Chip Frontline study, just 35 patients reported, but with an overall response rate of 100% and 89% complete response rate. I don't know if you've got any of the frontline bispecific trials open in Barcelona, but I'm interested in your thoughts on these sort of very early data. Yes, we actually... <laughs> It's quite intriguing because we have too many trials now in first line. So we have the EPCO, we have the GLOFIT trials in first line, and we have Zuma 23, and we have first line high risk uh, YTB 3 to 3, which is a Zuma 12 model. So many options. The issue is deciding which one <laughs> we offer that patient. So I, I think that's very exciting data. And that's also, I think, the issue with GLOFID ZMOX is that we, I think we're expecting bispecifics to end up maybe in the first line. So all of these trials in the relapse refractory setting seem exciting, but I think we're definitely most excited about the, the trials combining bispecific antibody agents with with uh, polychemotherapy in the first line. So I, I think results, as you mentioned, with EPCO and Polar TIP are, are definitely um, intriguing. I think they're very small numbers. So we have to, you know, look forward to longer follow-up, higher numbers. But I think, you know, that would definitely rival CAR T cells in the front line and could potentially become a new standard of care if, you know, the results, of course, support that. And just to add, I also see some data with Epcritimab and DMOX in a star glow, but not, it's not a randomized trial. It's a single arm trial with epcoritamab and, and Zmox. And also the results were quite encouraging. They were in line with what we've seen with glufitamab and, and Zmox in the star glow. Similar response rate, I believe around 55, 60%. But it does seem that like bispecifics together with Zmox provide this complete response rate. I think in the end, it comes down to the longer follow-up and what's the, the fraction of patients who are cured to finally give like a final opinion on these types of trials and also see if bispecifics are finally positioned in the first line, because then definitely we may not want to repeat them in the relapse refractory setting. Um, I had a quick follow-up. So as with the CAR T cell trials, we had the randomized trial comparing in the second line specifically, comparing CAR T cell therapy versus chemoimmunotherapy followed by autologous transplant. Are there any similar trials with bispecific ongoing where bispecifics in the second line in DLBCL is being compared against chemoimmunotherapy followed by autologous transplant or are most of the bispecific trials in a transplant ineligible population? We do have trials with, because we I, I'm thinking we participated at least in, in one of them. It was a bispecific, I think it was a curita map, but I'm not 100% sure, combined with platinum-based salvage chemoimmunotherapy for transplant eligible patients. So they received the combo of the platinum-based salvage immunochemotherapy. Then they went on to receive the autologous stem cell transplant if PR or better to, to the salvage, and then could continue further with the bispecific. To be honest, I'm not sure this was a randomized or a single arm trial, but I know we've included some patients at our center in this trial. So I think that's given the good safety profile of bispecifics, more favorable definitely than CAR T cell therapy. I think the future of bispecifics, even though what we have now approved is monotherapy, I think the future, and that's how the companies envision it is to combine bispecifics with immunochemotherapy in the different lines and see eventually where they end up. But combination with immunochemotherapy definitely seems to be where they're trying to, to position these agents. Um, so there are trials in transplant eligible, transplant and eligible first line, um, all, all, the, all the different scenarios that you can imagine. 
Yeah, I think they're going, there's peppered the whole trial landscape. I just don't know if there are, I, I don't know, also don't know if there are randomized trials in that setting, but definitely lots of IITs in that setting, Raj. So you mentioned Zuma 7. One of the other interesting things I want to get your thoughts on is transform. There was the three-year follow-up data was presented. Of course, as a reminder to people, the transform 180 patients randomized to salvage immunochemo plus auto transplant for responders versus lysocell. One of the two main differences in terms of design of many, though, were that everyone in both groups was aphoreased for lysocell and crossover was built into the trial. And the other one being that bridging therapy was allowed, whereas Zuma 7, you could only have steroids. I think they're two of the main differences anyway. And the, there continues to be a significant progression-free survival benefit. But I, I think what a lot of us are interested in is the overall survival. And of course, when you look at the numbers, the three-year overall survival, 62.8% versus 51.8%, hazard ratio of 0.75, but not significant. And 62% of standard of care patients crossed over to receive lysocell. So intrigued to hear what you think about the overall survival results and, and why they turned out the way they did. Yeah, I think you made a great point highlighting the differences. It is true that when they talk about, when they review the data of Zuma 7, they also always stress the fact that even though crossover was not allowed in the Zuma 7 trial, over 50% of patients who progressed on the standard of care arm eventually went on to receive CAR T cell therapy outside of the clinical trial setting, which of course is not yeah, exactly, it's not exactly ideal. I think it's definitely more legit, let's say, to allow patients to receive the, the treatment on trial. And I think leukophoresis prior to starting the second line regimen is definitely something positive that you're offering to patients, trying to collect those. T cells before they're exposed to more treatment and potentially receiving the CAR T cells earlier than if they have to exit the trial and start working in that process outside of the clinical trial setting. So I think it speaks in favor of the TRANSFORM trial that they built that in to the trial, collecting earlier, allowing to offer lysocell earlier to patients and not having to do that off trial. And then allowing bridging also permits patients who are potentially progressing quicker or have a higher tumor burden, and you would maybe not include them on a trial like Zuma 7, where you can only do steroids as bridging. So I think both crossover and bridging are features that speak in favor of transform. In terms of the overall survival benefit, I think it's always complicated when crossover is allowed inside a clinical trial to, to see a significant overall survival benefit. I think we need longer follow-up to confirm that data, but in any case, the curves do seem to clearly separate. It's true that it's not significant. And of course, we need it to be to call it significant, but still you do see a clear separation between those curves and taking into account these differences, the built-in crossover inside the trial, allowing bridging. It's true that turnover was a bit longer for Jeremy Abramson mentioned this. It was like 30 plus days in comparison to, let's say, one week or 10 days less for Axicel and for the Zuma 7 trial that could have also impacted potentially the CAR T cell efficacy a bit in, in some rapidly progressing patients. So that could have also played a role. In terms of the efficacy, Lysocell seems to have on trial. We don't have a lot of experience in Spain in the real world, but on trial, it seems to have good efficacy in line with what you could expect as well with Axicel. Efficacy seems to be similar. In the mats, adjusted and indirect comparisons seems to be this way as well. Safety seems to be, seems to be, is better than Axicel. I, I think there's no clear explanation. It's probably for the lack of significant overall survival benefit. It's probably multifactorial features playing into that. I, I do think that I would not probably read too much into that. We'll see with longer follow-up, you know, where the curves end up. Zuma 7 has longer follow-up and that could have also helped observe let's say, those significant differences. So we'll see when they reach the five-year mark where the difference is at. But I, I still think they're very encouraging results. Yeah, absolutely. Shall we move a little bit to talk about mantle cell lymphoma for a bit? Of course, the ECHO trial is, is worth chat chatting about. In some ways, the sequel to the SHINE trial, which compared bendamustine rituximab plus or minus acalabrutinib, obviously second generation BTK inhibitor in first line treatment of patients 65 or older with mantle cell lymphoma, 600 patients included 
and with a median follow-up of 45 months, we're getting into the territory, which we thankfully now need in mantle cell lymphoma to start to interpret the result. Um, I think structure was very similar to the SHINE trial with obviously a better tolerated BTK inhibitor. So the patients continued the acalabrutinib while while they were having the bendamustine retux and then ongoing after that. The median follow-up 45 months PFS Median was not reached in the ACALA arm versus 62 months. So a bit over five years in the bendamustine rituximab arm with a significant hazard ratio uh, and p-value and overall survival, at least the curves are the right way around compared to Shine where they're slightly the wrong way around. Both of those results not significant. Yeah, so what did you make of the ECHO trial and how do you think it fits into the elderly slash unfit mantle cell lymphoma landscape? I, I think it's a very interesting trial. I reviewed I reviewed the, the Echo and the Shine data because I think it puts everything in, in context. And the thing is, if we do BR and the calabrutinib in the first line, then probably would consider going, first question would be, okay, and what's next? In the sense, we know patients, we can see how the curves drop. There's definitely not a plateau there. So we'll probably be considering CAR T cell as a potential treatment option after that. So if we're doing both BR and the BPK inhibitor together in the first line, what pops into my mind is, okay, so we're going straight to CAR T cells right after doing BR. It is true that the patient will be on rituximab and acalabrutinib maintenance, perhaps for some time. So that can space the R-benda from the leukophoresis, but still, I guess I'm perhaps um, incorrectly, I'm a bit reluctant to put an incurable disease where patients are going to progress and require other treatment options to put all the eggs in one basket. So <laughs> doing the BPK inhibitor at the same time as the BR regimen, I think the question is why not do it sequentially and just do the immunochemo and then the BPK inhibitor and then move forward with potentially with CAR T cell therapy after that. I think the results definitely, as could be expected, yeah, favor the acalabrutinib arm in terms of efficacy, as you've mentioned, as could also be expected, a bit higher talk in the acalabrutinib uh, arm in comparison to the BR arm. And the overall survival, I'm not sure if you want to get into that uh, a little bit later on, and perhaps I'm jumping in here. It is true that the curbs like completely overlapped, and uh, Michael Wang actually said this in his presentation on Shine, they completely overlapped on Echo. They do seem to slightly separate, but just so slightly. <laughs> and then they do this whole big controversial COVID censoring, which I'm not fully in agreement with. And of course, they see more of a trend for an overall survival benefit in the calabrutinib arm when the COVID censoring is performed. So I think with the data that we have right now, we have to see, say there's no overall survival benefit. There is a progression-free survival benefit, which is the primary endpoint. It is a positive trial, as Dr. Wang said, but in, la in the absence of an overall survival benefit, I think it would still be legit to say, okay, let's do first the immunochemotherapy and then go to the BTK inhibitor. Yeah, sorry, I had a follow-up question uh, as a non-lymphoma expert. So regarding the COVID, did they censor for patients who developed COVID infection or severe infection or like anybody who developed COVID infection? And why would, since that would be a toxicity of concern, wouldn't that lead to some kind of informative censoring if, if one arm is having more of that compared to the other arm? Yeah, so they usually uh, censor for deaths due to COVID. Okay, so only deaths. Certainly when they presented the overall survival data on the same slide, mm -hmm. they have a second set of curves where COVID-19 deaths are censored. Okay, so basically, instead of counting those as events for overall survival, they are censoring those. Um, and was there an imbalance in the COVID-19 deaths in both arms? There was, right? There was more in the ECALA plus BR arm. Yeah, I, I yes. don't know. I mean, it just doesn't sound legit to me to censor because those are toxicity-related deaths. So you can't pick and choose what you will censor because there could be unexpected deaths on, on both arms. Exactly. And I think the fact is, if the patient had not died due to COVID, maybe he would have died due to another infection. I think the underlying rationale is the underlying, you know, idea is that patient, which is receiving both the immunochemotherapy and the BTK inhibitor, is at a higher risk of infection. So it was COVID, it could have been influenza, it could have been any other virus or bacterial infection. So I think you can't just put that, that data in, in a drawer and, and try to hide it. I, 
definitely, of course, I understand COVID did have an impact. It's unfortunate for the trial, but I think it is what it is. It could have been another type of infection. And I think we cannot just censor those patients because even if we're, I, I could even partially agree with censoring, but the thing is that if that patient had not died due to COVID, I, I go back to that thought, he could have potentially died from another type of infection. So that just still reflects a higher vulnerability to infections. And that is, yeah, an increased toxicity is what kind of plays, let's say, the, the opposite card in terms of the better, say, a better efficacy with a calabutinib uh, added to the BR arm, but higher tox. And that kind of evens out your oral survival benefit um, that we do not really see. I just, just in case you're interested in terms, because I was just looking at that, the COVID-19 related adverse events, there were 20 grade five COVID-19 related adverse events. So that means that's on the calabutinib BR arm and 20 on the placebo BR arm. Yes, COVID's still here, unfortunately, but but not in those curves. But anyways, I think, yeah, I think an interesting trial. And really, I think I agree with you. It still leaves open this question of whether we should put all our eggs into the, or two of our eggs into the same basket or use them sequentially. And I think, I think it's tricky to be, especially in the really older, frailer patients, it's tricky to be persuaded to be persuaded we should really throw everything all at once, but but certainly very interesting and useful data. If we move to chat a bit about Hodgkin lymphoma, I thought the HD21 updated results were very intriguing. Certainly be interested to hear how you approach things in Spain, how Germanic you are in your Hodgkin treatment. But of course, HD21 first presented last year at, at Lugano, the updated results of escalated beer cop versus Recad. So adding brentuximab vedotin to first line classic Hodgkin lymphoma, patients with advanced stage disease and adapted trials. So in both arms, patients got uh, interim pet after two cycles and four cycles if they're pet negative, six cycles if uh, pet positive. And in, in the trial, about two thirds of both arms only had uh, four cycles, which is obviously 12 weeks. It was a open label randomized trial of 1500 patients. Gee, the, the German Hodgkin group are incredible at recruiting patients to trials, although SWOG 1826 also recruited beautifully on the other side of the Atlantic. Median age of 31 and about two thirds of patients had B symptoms. Before we dive into the results, yeah, tell us a little bit about your Hodgkin context, how you approach Hodgkin as a baseline, and then how you think this trial fits into that. Yes, unfortunately, I have to say that our approach is quite ABVD oriented, so we are not very Germanic. When I was in Lugano, yeah, in, yeah, in Switzerland, they definitely do follow the German guidelines. But in Spain, it, yeah, it's summed up in ABVD, and we do the raffle protocol and AVD, uh, pet negative after two cycles. So we do not use escalate via COP, and we will probably not use BRCA either. But I have to say, I'm, I'm, I'm really impressed by their effort, by the trial. I think it's mind-blowing. So I, I can only but congratulate them on, on such a great effort. I think they tried, they, they put the bar so high. They try to get the efficacy and now they're fighting to get a better safety toxicity profile, which I think is great because that's always been one of the kind of underlying criticisms, let's say, of SPD a cop, that it was sometimes not that easy to tolerate for some patients. So I think it's really great that they're working in that direction. It's not so straightforward, I think, to work in that direction of improve and reduce uh, toxicity. So they did improve the transfusion rate, the neuropathy, resolution of adverse events. All of these issues were highlighted during the presentation as being improved on BRCA versus escalated via COP. And of course, the whole recovery of the reproductive capacity of both women and men that was a separate oral presentation. So I, I think if you follow the German guidelines, I think you should definitely adhere to, to BRCA. I think data couldn't be more solid. They have a significantly, as you mentioned, significantly improved PFS, comparable overall survival, because it's difficult to do better than 98, 99%. And the safety profile is, is definitely very encouraging. The idea of only getting four cycles and then done with that in, in 12 weeks is quite impressive. And that was a possibility in like two thirds of patients, approximately 64% of patients who achieved that two negative status. So that was a reality for many patients on that trial. So I think it's really a great treatment option and definitely something to consider. 
Yeah, so to give the, the, the numbers for the both the top line efficacy and tolerability results, the four-year progression-free survival, 94.3% versus 90.9%. So getting pretty good that at four years, 94% of patients haven't progressed. And overall survival, as you mentioned, 98% in both. Um, and in terms of tolerability, the, the particularly notable ones were reduction in transfusion frequency, reduction in peripheral neuropathy, and also some nice analyses showing that 68% of those in the BRCAD arm were treated with full doses through the sixth cycle, whereas only four, by the time you got to the sixth cycle of those who got six cycles, only 43%. So an extra sort of quarter of patients who were able to be kept at the full dose level. So... Yeah. So I guess to, to put it back onto you in terms of your context, because this is the question I think that all of the US clinicians are grappling with looking at this data is how good does a beer cop alternative or a regimen that builds on beer cop have to be to entice some of the ABD, ABVD crew to consider a Germanic style regimen? I think it can't really get much better than this, <laughs> to be sincere. I'm sure they'll do better because they always do. They just work with another trial, HD 37. But I think, as you mentioned, the PFS and the OS data, it's as good as you can get. And the safety data is also very encouraging. I don't think we'll, or maybe perhaps I'll be surprised, but I don't think we'll ever have a randomized trial between an ABD, ABVD backbone-like regimen and a BRCAD so I, I have to say that if I'm honest, I think the US and like Spain and other countries who are doing ABVD like regimens will continue in that direction. And <laughs> Germans and the surrounding Germanic followers will continue to do a uh, breakhead. And I think this is just going to continue to be the same. I think perhaps I'm mistaken, but I, I think there's still some concerns on safety mainly. And I think physicians are not accustomed to doing these types of regimens, they'll be reluctant to start doing it now, considering the great results we have from AVD together with Nevo, with Brentuximab and uh, these new combinations. So I think it's going to be tough to make these centers move in the direction of BRCAD and away from ABVD type combinations. Yes, the time old debate rages on. I, I think it, it would be great to discuss briefly the fertility data because I think it's really great to see them presenting such well done fertility data, including 80% of intention to treat patients. And to also see them presenting both the biochemical endpoint, which was time to FSH recovery, but also the number of people, both women and men becoming pregnant in either arm, um, uh, very much numerically favoring the BRCAD arm, and in terms of FSH recovery, 86%. So very stark difference in both time to FSH recovery and proportion of patients having an FSH recovery and a similar effect seen in men. And interesting, you can see that when you look at the curves, both the number of cycles they receive, four versus six makes a difference and whether they got BRCAD or beer cop made a difference. Yeah, I'm interested to see your thought, hear your thoughts on that, that fertility data as well. Oh, I think this is very important because this is definitely one of the many differences that physicians have in mind when they consider escalated beer cop, which was the, let's say, the standard for Germany before BRCAD came along and ABVD would definitely that issue of fertility is not as great with the BVD as it is with escalated BACOP. There is definitely a big difference there. And this is one of the many issues in terms of toxicity that was considered when selecting, I think, ABVD instead of escalated BACOP. Others could be definitely, yeah, other types of hematological toxicity, fatigue, are there other safety issues. But this was, I think, one of the main issues on the table in terms of safety and toxicity, which is th the big issue, I think, with the German style regimens. And if they really put that barrier behind them and it move forward with this benefit, I think this could potentially also help some physicians go in the direction of choosing this record regimen as opposed to maybe the, the idea they had of Escalade via COP in terms of toxicity. So I, I think this is very important data. I think they presented it, as you mentioned, very clearly, very nicely. And this could definitely help convince some physicians to move forward with this regimen. 
Yeah, I think it's I think it's very really great to see how thoroughly and how early we're getting that fertility data because it is so important to our young patients, particularly with Hodgkin lymphoma. So I think it would be fun to do a little roundup of a couple of other uh, abstracts that that piqued mine and your interest. So feel free to throw in any that 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 you also thought were interesting. One of the one of the thought provoking ones I thought was the MD Anderson at small trial forty patients of using pertubrutinib plus venetoclax plus abinutuzumab. Pertubrutinib, of course, being a, con- covail- a non-covalent BTK inhibitor in the frontline setting. And I, yes, yeah, so I'm intrigued. Obviously, the overall response rate, 100%, but small and early numbers. But uh, yeah, interested to hear. And then there were lots of CLL abstracts combining various of these three good classes of very active drugs in CLL, various combinations of those in the front line as well. But intrigued to hear your thoughts about, about that trial and the combination of trials in frontline CLL. Yeah, I think this is a very interesting trial. As you mentioned, I think the caveats are the small numbers and the limited follow-up. And I'm always wary when they put together all these non-chemo-free agents, targeted agents together that the risk of toxicity will really increase and we'll start seeing all of these infections as has been the case in the past in some trials, even opportunistic or fungal infections. I think this is a, a thing we have to really keep an eye out when we're putting together all of these targeted agents, who, which are, of course, very active in these B-cell malignancies. I, I think it's, it's intriguing data, but it's true that, again, the CLL, as we talked about with the ECHO trial in anti-cell lymphoma, we're not looking to, to cure these patients. We're trying to keep them in remission as long as possible. So again, I'd have to see, I'd need really long follow-up to better understand what's the benefit in terms of duration of response. Like how long does it take them to get to another regimen? I think that would be time to next treatment would be one of these endpoints I'd like to look at. Even more than undetectable MRD and all of these exploratory analyses, which I think are very interesting from an academic point of view, but I think for the for the patient, the most important endpoint is how long will he stay on that treatment and be progression free, and how long will he take to get to the next line of therapy? If the if achieving a deep response prolongs that time, great. But I think it's very important to get like really long follow up on these trials and watch out for those late infections, those maybe late onset adverse events before we consider this a potential regimen to be registered or FDA approved or whatever. I think it's very important that I get more solid data before we, we get too excited about the efficacy data, which is usually, as can be expected, fantastic when we're putting together all the agents which work in CLL. <laughs> Absolutely. The Achilles heel, perhaps, of CLL is Richter transformation. Patients with Richter transformation to large cell lymphoma still don't have great outcomes. And so perhaps worth mentioning briefly, the epcaridumab single agent data in, in 35 patients with Richter transformation response rate, overall response rate 53%. Some of these patients were first line, some were second line, and unsurprisingly, the overall incomplete response rates were better in the first line setting. Median overall survival 11 months, but only median eight months of follow-up. So early data, but interested to hear how this factors into your Richter transformation uh, approach. Yeah, I'm actually quite excited about this trial because we're getting now, we know that Richter's um, can be treated with CAR T cell therapy in certain countries. It has reimbursement in certain countries and does not have in others. So for example, in Spain, we do not have reimbursement to treat Richter's with commercial CAR T cell therapy, but in, for example, in the UK, uh, they do. So it, it's kind of country to country. And of course, this is really bad news for our patients. We cannot offer them commercial CAR T cell therapies. I have a couple of patients actually currently with Richter's and we're struggling in some trials re- require two prior lines for Richter's before they can include the patients. We know that immunochemotherapy is usually not, not a definitive answer. It's usually, of course, we'll try it out, but it's definitely usually a bridge to something else. Patients do not usually benefit long-term from our standard our top. So we're often struggling to find other immunotherapy approaches. And we were actually discussing this morning a patient, one of the two patients I mentioned, considering uh, bispecific antibody therapy for this uh, patient. Other options, of course, being explored are combining like venetoclax with some kind of an EPOC type regimen, but this patient had already received venetoclax for, for CLL. 
immune checkpoint inhibitors have been discussed in other trials and other meetings. And the data from epicoritamab is pretty encouraging. I think also it's important to take into account that now there's a couple at least that I can recall publications also reviewing real world results of CAR T cell therapy for Richter's. So we had the data presented by Dr. Pitai at ASH and published in, in JCO. Then we had in, hematolo- in Hematologica, a paper just came out by the MSK group reviewing real world data of CAR T cell therapy for Richter's. And as could be to some extent expected, the results are not as favorable as are for standard diffuse large B-cell lymphoma patients. So I think there's definitely a gap there where biospecifics could definitely be a, a good option. Potentially a transplant to another genetic stem cell transplantation that should be definitely discussed for young patients with Richter's. Um, but in any case, a good treatment option. I think it's not, there are not that many treatment options which are like established in that setting. So I think there is, there's definitely a need there for more treatment options. And I, I think the results from Ecuritumab are, are quite encouraging. And we are considering bispecific antibody therapy for some of our patients. Yeah, absolutely. I, we've only got a couple of minutes left. Do, were there any abstracts you wanted to chat about that we haven't got to? Not really. I, I think these cover most of the abstracts I had reviewed to discuss today. I just, regarding the HD21, the Hodgkin's abstract, I just thought it was quite intri- intriguing. The, gonna, the trial recruited patients up to 60, but Peter Borkman mentioned that they will have some data coming out potentially this year of older patients with BRICAT, given its good safety profile, 60 to 75 years of age. So I put that down to be sure to watch out for that data. I think it will be definitely very interesting. And I don't think I have anything else I had planned to share with you today, but I'm happy to discuss any other abstract if you had one in mind. I think that's a great round out. We've done a, taken a bit from each disease. We've each of the big, bigger diseases, we've, I think there were some of the big abstracts. Thank you so much for joining us and sharing your expertise and your wisdom. We really appreciate you coming on the podcast. Thank you. Thank you. I hope it was <laughs> good for my first podcast and I hope people will enjoy it. Well, thank you very much. It was great. Thanks, Gloria. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.